Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our panel, Enabling the Digital Future. I am joined by this esteemed panel today to discuss what lies ahead and what challenges we have and potentially what we've gotten right. My name is Yvette Valdez. I'm a partner at Latham, the New York office. Um, I'm head of the U.S. Derivatives Regulatory Group, and I also co-chair the Digital Assets Task Force. I am joined by um, Rapalas Lakavicius, the policy officer at the European Commission, uh, Peter Golder, who is chief commercial officer at, at Six Digital Exchange, Bill Hughes, senior counsel and director of global regulatory matters at Consensus. Um, and that's it. We're going to have a good conversation today. Um, and I think to, to kick it off, we wanted to level set a little bit with what we're actually talking about. So I'll start off with some thoughts from Peter and Bill. What is it that we are building? What is our, our digital future uh, in centralized and decentralized finance? And I think in particular, understanding whether we view it as this fragmented policy today or a fragmented future, or is it really coming together um, as one? Maybe we'll kick it off with, with Peter and his thoughts. Sure, thanks, Yvette. Um, I guess for me, the starting point is a couple of assumptions around, um, you know, trying to figure out what is it that 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 we are uh, really building. And for me, some of these assumptions revolve around, um, for sure, we want to solve for commercial outcomes. So, you know, there, there is a commercial imperative behind this that drives this. Um, Likewise, we do need to have uh, liquidity in the system because otherwise there is no transaction taking place. Um, and in a similar sort of vein, we know that money is mercenary. So money goes where there is a return, especially right now with um, you know, where interest rates are. And at the same time, we have to cater for a multi-chain environment, um, but we'll probably see convergence across different uh, ecosystems, different chains, and ultimately people want to trade different asset classes on, on a similar sort of venue. So to some degree, this is about an ecosystem transition from the traditional financial market infrastructure to digital market infrastructure type world. And, you know, for me, the difference between centralized, decentralized, you know, to some degree, this is about degrees of governance. Uh, but there is another important uh, aspect to this, which is uh, democratization, um, which is about providing access to new asset classes, uh, opening up assets to different uh, institutions, uh, for instance, carbon, uh, the democratization of hedge funds. And that to me for, is, is about creating asset transparency, asset interoperability, uh, and, and from a business model perspective, because you know, for me, digital is all about business model innovation. It's making sure that you have the right tool for the, for the right job and ultimately aligning um, the desired behaviors with the right incentives. So for me, that there's probably going to be a continuum across uh, centralized, decentralized for some time. Uh, but it's more about making sure that the business model that we have, what we're trying to solve for, is properly catered for, makes sense, and that we have the right um, tools for the job. Yeah, Peter, can can you speak a little bit about how Six Digital Exchange is sort of preparing for this future? I'd like to hear a little bit about your day job and how it interacts with with those visions. So we we went live um, in Q4 last year. Um, live means we have a license to operate. Uh, we have a regulated uh, trading uh, platform and the and the DLT based regulated CSD. Uh, never been done before, so this is a first, and, and we're very proud of that. And you know, for us now, the the, the imperative is how do we build um, out this platform? And that's really about two things: one, to exploit what we have uh, on day one. This is a sort of a continuous journey. But the first part is to to exploit what we have in terms of products, in terms of um, capabilities, uh, and that's really, let's call it load the platform. The second part then is about 
exploring adjacencies across products. Um, you know, at, at the moment, uh, we're, we're focused on public markets. We see opportunities uh, in ESG, crypto, private markets, uh, and then complementing that with uh, different capabilities um, going into related areas, so tokenization, building that out into different asset classes, uh, extending the functionality and the degree of automation that we see across capital markets value chain. When you think about um, carbon, for instance, there is an, an, a requirement for monitoring uh, <coughs> compliance uh, around carbon to avoid greenwashing. And then finally, it's also about making sure that um, we build geographical bridges into different uh, regions. We, we, we are very active in Singapore at the moment. It's about building a global liquidity highway. So these are sort of the, the three things which um, certainly keep me and, and, and the team uh, very busy. And ultimately, you know, down the road, we also see some convergence between different asset classes, uh, whether that's crypto uh, and traditional assets. And, and ultimately, people want to have capital efficient models, um, which allow them to trade uh, on one platform, different asset classes, uh, but also across different um, instrument types. So for instance, uh, spot and derivatives. Right. Thank you, Peter. Bill, from, from Peter's remarks, I'm hearing themes of interoperability, connectivity, and also efficiency, right? And I think the lens that you bring from being at consensus is um, potentially under the hood, right? And infrastructure and tech and not just purely on the trading ass layer of it, but also outside of trading. Um, what, what do you see as sort of that, that digital future? Um, and, and, and is it the same themes that, that, that Peter has sort of highlighted in the trading space? I think so. Um, I first want to say thanks for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here and to be with you all. Um, you asked, what are we building? I suppose it depends. The answer depends on who you're talking to. But if you're talking to um, a company like Consensus, which is crypto native, the answer is a global digital economy that is completely internet native. And so its structure and functioning are not based on a nation's laws or a committee's decisions, or God forbid, one, one person's prerogative, but on rules established by computer code that is contributed to by thousands. And that is transparent, both as it is now and as it evolves. So this economy has lots of elements to it. There will be tokens that are units of account. There'll be tokens that are mediums of exchange. There'll be stores of value. There'll be native assets, things that only exist in this digital space. And there are gonna be assets which are essentially digital corollaries to real world assets, whether they're physical or whether they're um, not necessarily physical, things like stocks and rights and other things. So, and there'll be markets in which these different elements are exchanged and they're gonna be commercial markets where they're transacted over buyers and sellers for use purposes. So in its purest expression, because um, blockchain technology can be obviously applied for many different use cases in its purest expression, it's an original expression. These are economies without walls. Today you have internet economies for sure. Um, the two biggest ones are run by Facebook and Google. Uh, those obviously um, are very different. Uh, you interact with those economies, essentially, if you think about it, at the leave of those authorities who have absolute power over those systems. Um, they built them, they run them. Uh, the value those systems create is only shared to the extent that they agree to share it, which often they do because it's in their interest, but only to the extent it's in their interest. Uh, the plan with these new ones is that Anyone can participate, anyone can innovate, and in doing so, anyone can participate and realize the wealth creation that these networks will be creating. But it's more fundamental than new economies. These permissionless blockchains give rise to never before possible communities that are global in scale. And so we're talking about culture, not just economy. These are organically grown, and they 
um, they don't just talk and exchange information ideas. They're actually engaging in economic activity, both internally to those communities and externally with the broader world, other communities, et cetera. Um, so we see digital communities today. We see them in Reddit, we see them in Instagram, but again, just like Google and Facebook, those are fundamentally different. The ones that are coming are more organic, more participatory. About your centralization versus decentralization question. Um, I think the future is both. And anybody who says one or the other, I don't think is being fair. Um, the future is both centralized and decentralized, but over time, and you're starting to see this now, it is definitely trending more decentralized over time. So today, most activity in crypto, most participation is happening through centralized authorities, through exchanges, and through more traditional looking and acting middlemen. Uh, and some of that is, in my view, almost certainly going to be the case for years to come. Um, and admittedly, sometimes a centralized system is better than a distributed one because decentralization has its trade-offs. But there are certainly many systems where the most efficient system is not one where a party or a cartel um, is in control of the rules and how they're implemented. And it's, it's those sorts of systems that will trend toward being decentralized. Um, and what does that mean? It's the centralized authority that dictates and implements the rules will no longer be an entity, it will just be software. And that software, anyone around the world will be able to check for themselves. And anyone can participate if they got the right computer, meaning not something from my youth, but sufficiently um, up to date, electricity and an internet connection. Um, so it'll be both, but I think the, the, the truly um, world-changing things will be those systems which migrate over to a decentralized structure. So I see, I mean, the, the comment on sort of moving this digital economy to something that is just organically decentralized where it's effectively run by a smart contract really is, is sort of the, the, the original DAO, if you will. Um, and I think right now we're, we're seeing a lot of corporate governance and participation based on this decentralized concept th through these DAOs. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's a really interesting point to sort of see how this will continue to organically evolve. And I think that's where governmental authorities come into play and in thinking through what their role is going to be. And I'm interested in, in, in Rapolas' thoughts, which is, you know, what do you see as the role of the European Commission and other regulatory bodies and legislative bodies as this digital economy does become more and more decentralized. Um, you know, Wyoming um, has effectively a structure to recognize a DAO and, and many, many um, crypto natives wouldn't necessarily uh, say that it's, it's the ideal form, but it's something. Um, and I think we will continue to see sort of this, this evolution of digital economy be decentralized. So I'm interested in your thoughts as to what that role is what are the challenges, you know, and what's the European Commission doing now in the sense um, to sort of prepare for that digital economy or support it, if you will? Um, so first of all, hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I would like a little bit to uh, point out that uh, the European Commission, of course, uh, it's considered as a governmentally a governmental authority, but it's not a, like a full, fully sovereign authority, like for example, the government of United States. Though we are doing quite a lot of uh, work in supervising uh, the single market and the, the, the European digital single market and involving European member states. So probably we can consider that European, that in this case I can represent public public uh, institutions. So as a, as a probably everyone knows, the European Commission is a big entity having a lot of uh, directorates generals uh, and, and a, a lot of, uh, we can call it bureaucratic, administrative uh, uh, 
have uh, divisions uh, who are performing quite quite a lot of uh, work. Uh, in, in Europe, of course, with that, besides European Commission, we have the European Council, the European Parliament, and they are also playing uh, very, very important and, and uh, very respected roles in overall legislative process. So what, what the Commission has in, in this case is so-called the right of initiative. So what we in the Commission can do, we can propose legislations. So that is probably very important uh, and probably the, the, the most important legislative uh, role of the Commission. But once the legislation is proposed, it's already with the Council and with the Parliament to come out with the final version there. So of course, we are proposing some legislations in, in this direction to, to give some certainty to the actors of the European single market. Uh, another function quite important of the uh, Commission is the regulatory function. So to re regulate on, ongoing uh, various rules and regulations to make sure that they are all followed properly. Afterwards, in the Commission, what we do is quite a bit is uh, support to research and innovation. We have collaborative research program Horizon 2020, which now will be Horizon Europe. In there, we have we had a really high number of projects uh, in research and innovation area, which in from one or the other side are touching blockchain related and DLT related uh, questions. So there is quite a bit of activity going on there. Another role is support to standardization. And in here, my, me, myself, I, 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 I was working quite a bit, in particular in blockchain standardization area. Uh, but overall, for example, in ICT area, we have uh, the rolling plan for ICT standardization, which goes through uh, a, a number of uh, different topics. And uh, of course, we, we bring together all interested parties to, to a little bit help to coordinate uh, efforts uh, and to align their positions. And last but not the least, uh, when this uh, COVID uh, pandemic started, um, basically the European Commission has, uh, it has launched uh, the Resilience and Recovery Facility, which is distributing more than 300 billion euro in grants, so it's humongous funding and it's uh, supporting digital and green, so-called twin transition. And uh, yeah, of which basically we, we hope approximately 20% or, or more of budget to be allocated to digital, to digital various initiatives. And most of countries are coming out with ideas of to redevelop uh, their basically all IT systems, all, all governmental IT systems, and to come out with basically next generation uh, go, 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 government, go, government ready for the new upcoming digital age. So quite a bit of activities there and quite, an, quite a nice initiative, which uh, is being also followed by my unit and is being implemented by my colleagues in, uh, how to say, Parallel DG. Uh, is uh, European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, which is basically considered to be part of the Connecting Europe facility. And this infrastructure is currently being developed, but is uh, becoming quite, quite uh, mature and uh, hopefully it will be soon uh, really running some services for European citizens. Currently it has approximately 25 nodes uh, up and running. And uh, it's trying to develop some sort of uh, digital wallet for uh, self-sovereign identity so that basically each European who has uh, some sort of ID card or some sort of identities uh, confirmed would have a digital wallet with possibility to store some, let's say <laughs> assets or some, some documents or some information on blockchain. Uh, most advanced use case uh, based on this uh, digital wallet likely would be diploma use case, uh, educational credentials. So probably sometime in the future we will have uh, European educational credentials verifiable by on blockchain. Um, maybe if everything goes well, it will also be, uh, how to say, followed by social security records use case. So, so then in this case, we would move uh, social security records to blockchain, which would be also a very nice development. Besides that, there are other use cases like uh, traceability of documents or ver to verify various documents of various institutions, also trusted data sharing 
various collaboration with tax authorities. Uh, one of the ideas is also to have some sort of asylum seekers, uh, also data verifiable on blockchain or some financing. Uh, on top of that, EPSI is working with startups uh, and trying to bring them on, on board and to allow using them EPSI blockchain if, if they, they see some sort of interesting and relevant use cases there. So quite, quite a lot of activities in this area. And this involves also international collaboration. We have uh, with uh, Canada some ongoing workshops and discussions and probably if time go, go, if everything goes well, this uh, solution would be in interoperable in internationally, let's say with Canadians and maybe in the future with some other countries. So quite, quite a bit of uh, developments going on in from the side of the commission. Thanks, Rapalos. I mean, it's it's quite a bit undertaking um, and we see regulatory authorities, industry bodies, everybody obviously involved um, in, in trying to support, right, a healthy digital future. I think I want to, I want to sort of look to the regulatory and legal aspects of this and how we ensure sort of a healthy and robust um, digital future and, and the overlay of standards and rules that, that comes with that, which is traditionally centralized. Um, and, and with that, I, I want to move to, to Bill and in particular, as you were formerly in government, but now a crypto native like consensus, what do you see as the main challenges um, to get this right, right? What's the role of, of regulation and, and the supervisory authorities, governmental authorities in advancing or hindering digital technologies and blockchain? And what have they gotten wrong and what do you think they'll get right in the future? Uh, I'm not going to start with what they got wrong. I'll say, I'll, I'll start with what the main challenge to adoption is. And it it and I, I don't mean my answer to be a dodge to your question because I will address your question. But the biggest challenge to adoption is creating useful things and making them available to as many people as possible. And that has much more to do with innovation than it does regulation. So are the protocols and the apps on them as useful to as many people as possible, accessible by as many people as possible? It's early days, but we're seeing strong signs that we're moving in the direction of increasing utility, increasing access, both with respect to users participating in these networks and developers creating on top of them. Regulations can slow things down. Um, they have not meaningfully slowed things down yet. You know, a regulator can say, you can't commercialize any of these projects without registering with us. They can say, we generally don't think this stuff is safe and therefore, our constituent, constituency or a, or a cohort, some cohort within the broad pu public can't participate. We're not going to allow them. Or they can just simply chill innovation by saying, this is sort of like the stuff we regulate. And so we're going to start enforcing in this space. So be careful, um, um, even when those regulations seemingly don't apply. I think none of those tax will fundamentally I think there's the big picture thing to get your mind around is none of that is in the end going to matter. None of that will stop, um, fundamentally completely stop the, the innovation and the progress that we're making. And that's because this is a global ecosystem. It is beholden, it, it is be, um, it doesn't belong to any country, any particular financial regime. Um, it will find a productive place to mature. So it will rise and fall on its own merits. And it's in that regard, trending up very fast, both in terms of building and in terms of people um, who find it worthwhile to use it and participate in. And, and I think many policymakers, a lot from the, from the ones that I've talked to, uh, there's this fundamental um, misframing of the problem and the problem they're saying, well, what, what is my country supposed to do about regulating crypto and blockchain ecosystem? And um, they're very often used to regulating markets, which are entirely <laughs> within their purview. The proper question and, and the, the simple 
the, the, the false assumption there or the, or the mistake there is that this isn't there, this isn't one country's ecosystem. Um, and companies playing in the space are not beholden to one regulatory regime. Um, so it exists outside the regulatory purview of basically everybody faced with these questions. So the proper question is, how are we gonna position ourselves as a country, as an economy, for what could be a massive worldwide economic, technological, and social revolution. I don't like the, I don't mean for that to sound dramatic, but technological um, evolution of where we are today. Some are gonna say, no, thank you. We don't wanna be any part of it. And some will realize the writing on the wall um, and position themselves properly. Uh, I do think classically liberal societies, both politically and culturally will naturally gravitate gravitate to the space because as it becomes more useful, uh, its citizenry will demand it. It's a, its uh, business community will demand it. And the economic growth and the political pressure will be too great for the people in charge of federal and regional policy making to ignore it. In, in more closed top down, I think it's gonna be a mixed bag. Some will recognize the, the, um, the merits of it and will wanna participate to some degree, others, um, like some countries we're, we're seeing now or making noises now of like not wanting to have any part of it. Um, they will, they, they face their own problems, but they've, they've decided to sit this one out and they'll be able to think in the future about that decision. And, and, and I, I would wager we'll, we'll regret it in terms of, I actually like Everybody says clarity, clarity, clarity. We need regulatory clarity. I agree, but we need the correct rules rather than quick rules. I mean, there are certain instances of quick laws or quick rules in the United States, which are not productive. Um, there are some provisions of the re recent infrastructure bill, which are not productive. They're gonna be problems. We're gonna look back on them as mistakes. So I'd rather, the, the industry is fine continuing to build in with regulatory uncertainty. What we can't have is bad rules and counterproductive laws. But even with those, there will be spaces where the global crypto community will be happy to focus its attention or its operations and continue to build. And those people, those countries and those regulators and those policymakers that have made poor decisions initially will almost inevitably have the opportunity and the reason to re rethink those regulatory decisions, probably come to contrary conclusions once, once the writing is on the wall. How do you reconcile, I think all of that is right, um, but, but, but how do you reconcile the fundamental conflict between the digital economy and the decentralized nature and regulation, which is built on introducing intermediaries, right? And this yeah, is no, it's this is this is. I sorry, I'll let you finish your question. Um, right, I'm excited I, about this question. Um, but 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 essentially, right? Like there there is no right or wrong answer to this. Is what's that reaction? Yeah. How do how do we yeah. view that? And 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 where where is the reshaping and the reframing? by the regulatory bodies in, in the sense of what are we going to regulate or are we going to try to push the intermediary into this, which I think could be dangerous. And, um, and, and practically impossible and practically impossible. So the, this is just iterate on it. What do we know how to do? We know how to regulate intermediaries. What do we have in crypto? A lot of the crypto ecosystem now has intermediaries. I'm not talking about DeFi. I'm talking about centralized exchanges. I'm talking about registered financial advisors and other things. To, though, to the extent that the crypto ecosystem today has a lot of those traditional elements in it, and most of the economic activity flows through them, to the extent that you haven't come to ground on your regulatory regime with those things, start there. Start there. If uh, In the United States, there's a, a jurisdictional question as to you know, what the role of the CFTC should be, what the role of the SEC should be. We have Coinbase, we have Kraken, we have we have a lot of different things which are middlemen, and we don't have a clear regulatory regime. Let's focus our efforts on that. I think a lot of the risks, a lot of the benefits, a lot of 
what it fundamentally is in the di disintermediated space is still being developed. And that hasty, knee-jerk reaction of, like one, you don't understand the risks well enough. Two, you don't understand how the system itself is addressing those risks. Maybe there are other risks that are new, aren't, aren't germane to traditional finance that we need to understand better. It's not a terribly massive ecosystem, it's growing, but there's time to let it evolve and time for the industry to better appreciate those risks and take self-regulatory steps to address them. So I would, the, the simplest thing, the most productive thing to do is regulate what you already have, what's the most active and what you already know how to regulate and, and dedicate all your efforts to figuring that out and then allow the rest of the ecosystem to evolve. And, and as the risks manifest themselves and be, become clarified, then we can do things like have more robust, explicit disclosure regimes and things like that. But if we don't iterate on this, we're never going to get the right answer. That's right. Um, Peter, you know, similarly, with a digital exchange on your shoulders, what are the, what do you see as the main challenges in, in digital asset trading and and or in, in just trading generally and, and value transfer? And, I, you know, feel free to react sort of Bill's reactions on the role of the regulator in, in being a gatekeeper and how that's inherently, I think, a challenge in this digital economy. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think the two, two things that play into this. One is regulation. Uh, you know, we, we are fully regulated. So regulatory clarity is not unimportant. Um, but I do agree with Bill. The, 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 we we got to get it right. Um, and I think the other one which plays into this is standardization. Um, digital market infrastructure is a volume and efficiency game. So having standards is actually quite important. And when, when you compare digital, and I'm going to use the, the you know, traditional finance, the analog world, we have lots of standards in the analog world and we need to create, recreate, um, create different standards on the digital side. Uh, otherwise, we are not going to see the, the efficiency gains um, that we that we uh, that we can go after, and we, we also need to have standards to to drive the volume and the adoption. Um, when we look at standards, you can have standards at different levels. So there is clearly a product instrument standardization, but then there is also a broader: how do we create standards for a digital ecosystem? Uh, you know, GSMI is a good example of what we what we do through GSMI in, in terms of thinking industry wide. How do we create that adoption through standardization? Uh, we we for instance also need to think about um, what we talked about before in terms of cross chain interoperability, but that's also at an asset level, so asset transparency as a precursor to asset interoperability. Uh, on, the, on the settlement side, for instance, we need standards to figure out how do we do um, CBDC? Uh, how do we get that done? Uh, again, within a jurisdiction, but then also across jurisdictions. Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, th there is some degree of, of competition between what we have and, and where we're going uh, towards. So there is this transition from, from one uh, paradigm to, to the digital paradigm. Uh, again, the, the standardization around that or within that is, is quite important. Um, we, we also see that as an integral part towards democratization uh, or opening up different assets to, to new investors. I think again about, for instance, uh, the carbon example that I've given before. You know, people need to understand what does good look like. So to some degree, this is about making sure that you can invest and, and there is maybe a regulatory compliance aspect, but you need to have clarity around what that looks like. Uh, but then more broadly, for people to understand what they invest into, we, we need to have the ability to create uh, the provenance on these assets, the underlying assets, to go back and really check you know, what is it that I invest into, so the, the granularity of what you have. 
uh, is very important and to then create the due diligence around that again you need to have some degree of standardization to allow people to compare uh, different opportunities and make up their mind about you know which one is the right one for them given a certain risk appetite or, or a certain uh, requirements as, as it relates to return generation for instance yeah, I mean, I think I think your point on um, standardization is is a really important point. In particular, you know, when to to Bill's point about um, this market is developing and 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 at a very fast rate, and the market is reacting, and that's part of the market reaction, right? Which is creating these market wide industry standards that aren't being mandated or demanded by governmental authorities themselves, but the market really finding solutions in order to make this safe and robust. Um, and GBBC has been an important player in GSMI 1.0, the mapping exercise and now GSMI 2.0, which was released, really helping further and, and, and move the discussion forward with respect to creating industry standards. Um, and 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 I think, you know, there's been a lot of activity um, on the regulatory side as well, in particular um, in, in, in the EU, you know, Rapolas, Europe's been fairly responsive um, with MICA and, and the Data Act. You know, I think I, I would welcome your reactions or potentially thoughts with, with, with Bill's response um, or commentary, which is you don't want to act too hastily. And so... What are your thoughts on sort of these new um, regulations and the new regulatory framework, which the EU has been much quicker to adopt, I think, than, than the US? Um, and what challenges, right, would you say lie ahead? Because um, I think they're, they're really important sort of marquee moments for the EU and really trying to move this ahead. Um, but, but I also think that, you know, the, the question is, is this the right regulation? Um, and is this evergreen enough to really support the digital economy in the future? Um, thank you for your question. So first of all, I would like to uh, draw attention that the legislation at the EU scale involving 27 member states is a long exercise. It's not a very, that a, a very straightforward. It really takes time. So thank you for the compliment saying that the EU is uh, uh, relatively advanced in, in this area. And I, I probably need to agree with this, which is uh, in, this, in this case for me being as the official of the European Commission is, is, uh, is, very, is really great, great news. But uh, I, I, I have no doubt that other countries will catch up uh, pretty, pretty quickly with this. Uh, when it comes to markets and crypto assets, uh, regulation is currently a proposal. So it's, it is proposed by the Commission, but it is not really confirmed by the European Council and the European Parliament. It's still in process. So let's not be too optimistic on that. However, it's very, as you, as you pointed out, a very timely proposal, and it aims to give a clarity to precisely crypto assets. It identifies, for example, different types of tokens like utility tokens, investment tokens, payment tokens, and different functions that they could be doing. As well, it takes a look at, um, at the different actors, for example, that uh, startups and SMEs, uh, which have limited, uh, let's say, administrative reporting capacity, they would have some sort of simplified rules. The large players probably would be would be able to report in far more in depth and uh, and so on and so forth. So the the real aim is to really enable these crypto assets and to give clarity for market players so that they be be how to say sure to do their activities and make and and be sure that they are in line with the with the actually governmental rules and regulations so that there are no surprises. So that is. That is definitely very welcome legal regulation, and let us uh, look forward for it to be approved uh, as, as soon as possible. And when it comes to the Data Act, is again uh, a very important initiative. Uh, recently, relatively recently, the Commission uh, announced a new data strategy, and the review of Data Act is uh, going to be one uh, quite an important. Uh, 
parts of, of this strategy because as we all know data is uh, how to say the oil of new economy and uh, uh, in particular when it comes to, to blockchain blockchain applications or the lt technologies the data is basically playing a crucial role because in a lot of cases it verifies the veracity of, of let's say diff different data applications so this is uh, this is uh, again go probably going to be a, an important proposal by the commission which is still to be announced in the future but I would, I would really recommend for all entities who are interested, which are interested in European market to follow this development and to have data act as part of their, uh, on their radar, basically. Thank you, Ravalas. Um, it looks like we are actually at time and I wanna thank everybody, my panelists, um, for participating in this conversation. It's been great. I mean, I think it's gonna be a great year, another great year of development. Um, and then we'll do it again next year and, and see what additional developments we've had. But thank you again, Bill, Peter, and Rapalas. And um, thank you, GBBC.